Hello, these are the solutions to AP Physics 1 quiz number 4. Well, it's not really number 4, but it is our unit 4 quiz. So this would be essentially quiz 4.0. It is the only major quiz we had for this unit. And so these are the solutions, just to make sure that everybody is on the same page regarding why answers are the way they are. So for this first question, we have a two kilogram object traveling at five meters per second on a horizontal surface and it collides head on with and sticks to a three kilogram object initially at rest. So what does this look like? We have a two kilogram object moving at five meters per second, hits something that has a mass of three kilograms and V initial is zero. And then we want to know about the change in total kinetic energy and the resulting speed of the objects after the collision. Well, because this is saying that they stick to each other, we know that this is an inelastic collision. The only way for them to stick is if some amount of energy goes toward permanently rearranging the objects. So first off, we can actually eliminate A and B just from our knowledge of inelastic collisions because energy is used to rearrange or deform objects permanently. So since some energy is used, that means that our kinetic energy must decrease. Now the second portion is to find the speed of these objects afterward. So afterward we know that they stick together for a total mass of five kilograms and then they move off with some final velocity. So we'll use conservation of momentum that we can use for any collision. So our conservation of momentum would be P1 is equal to P2. And for us, that's going to be, in this case, we'll just go and say 2 times 5 for this initial momentum plus 3 times 0 for this initial momentum is equal to their final momentum. So it'll be 5 kilograms times the final velocity. So this term is 0, and that means that our fives end up canceling out. Therefore, our final velocity is equal to two. So that gives us our final answer of C, where our kinetic energy is decreased and our final speed is two meters per second. So for question number two, we have this setup where a cart is moving toward a force sensor. And we know the mass of the cart, so we know the mass, it's known. We know the speed of the cart, initial, and the cart hits this force sensor and rebounds. So the force sensor measures force, and we have two different ways to measure it. We can measure it as a function of time or as a function of position. So if we have measured as a function of time, it'll, look, it'll end up looking something like a spike. And if we measure it as a function of position, we don't really know what it'll be, but it'll also be something like this. And we want to know which of these two graphs could be used to determine the cart's speed after it rebounds. Well, from graph one, we know that the area of this graph is equal to force times time, which we know to be impulse. And if you've forgotten what impulse is, that is a change in momentum. And so our change in momentum, remember, could even be rephrased as m delta v. So if we know the mass and we know an initial velocity, then we can find our final velocity by simply going area is equal to mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity. So we can calculate area, we know the masses, because it's the same mass, and we know the initial velocity, leaving only the final velocity as an unknown, so we can find that using our first graph. The second graph is force as a function of position. So here, the area of this graph is F times our change in position, which we know to be work. In this case, our work, if you recall, is equal to the change in kinetic energy of an object. So that can be written as 1 half mass times V final squared minus 1 half mass times V initial squared. So here we have area is equal to our change in kinetic energy. We can find the area from whatever graph this makes. We know the masses, and we again know the initial velocity. So we can solve this for final velocity. So that means both of these graphs could be used to solve for the final velocity. 
So either graph, one or two, could be used to solve for final velocity. For number three, we have an interesting problem simply because it's not worded very well, and I apologize for that. However, we have the rate of change of linear momentum of sphere mass m. And so this graph shows the rate of change of momentum. So rate of change of momentum is delta p over delta t. Quick reminder there. For a sphere of mass m as a function of time, what is the momentum of the two-sphere system at three seconds? So because we're not given any other information here, we have to assume that it starts from rest. And therefore, if we're looking at the rate of change of momentum, well, our linear momentum then is going to be, all right, what is our change of momentum times our time interval? So essentially, we're looking for the area for this section. And so that area is simply going to be 5, which is our rate of change, multiplied by our time of 3 seconds, which is simply just 15 and that's going to be newton seconds or kilograms meters per second. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that's worth pointing out is that this delta p delta t is one of our new definitions for force that we derived at the beginning of the unit. So, regardless, in the end, our answer is b. This is something that could have been a little easy to overthink, but simply when you see a graph, you have to know that it's going to be related somehow to slope or area. So remembering this fact will help you remember that force times time gives you something to do with momentum. For question number four, we have a one-dimensional, perfectly elastic collision. So this should be a quick uh, reminder that P and kinetic energy, so momentum and kinetic energy, are conserved. So that helps us several different ways, but we have a mass M traveling with a speed V0 in the X direction and it strikes an object with a mass 3m that's at rest. So what does this look like? Well, here's our mass m. It's moving at a speed v0. It hits a mass 3m, and their v0 is 0. And we want to know the velocities after the collision. So there's two different ways that we could go about solving this problem. And one way to do it is simply to tackle it as you would a multiple choice question. So it's a collision which means we know that momentum must be conserved. So we can say that mv0 plus 3m times 0 is equal to mv, we'll say, 1 and 3m v2. <clears throat> so we can treat this as a multiple choice question in that we have all of the possible answers right here and we could simply try to plug some in and see if it works. Well, let's try the first one and see if it works. After the collision, it says mass m is moving at zero velocity. So that would be m times zero. And mass 3m is moving at v0 over 3. And this seems to work. OK, so this is possible. But we have to remember that we also need to check the fact that kinetic energy is conserved. So kinetic energy will look like this. So we have 1 half mv naught squared plus 1 half 3m times, this would be 0 squared, is equal to 1 half m times, in this case, 0 squared plus 1 half times 3m times, in this case, v naught over 3, pardon me, I'm running out of room, squared. So this whole set is 0. This whole set is 0. And we can see, just from looking at this, that we have 1 half mv naught squared equals 1 half 3m. And then if I square this, I have v naught squared over 9. So this would simplify to 1 half times, let's see, so the 3 will cancel, and we end up with 1 third, so that's going to be mv naught squared over 3. So these are not equal, so that rules out A. Whew. So we need to go into the next one. So it seems like the hard part for us is going to be making sure that the kinetic energy is conserved. 
So we can go through this by process of elimination, or we can actually set this up as a symbolic problem and solve for it. So I'm going to change colors here to a little brighter color, and we're just going to set this up. So I have mv0 plus 3m times 0 is my initial momentum. I still have mv1, and then I have 3mv2. So let's get rid of this. Pardon me, change colors. Get rid of this term, and I'm left simply with the fact that I have a lot of m's. So I'm actually going to cancel out all of my m's as well, because every term involves an m, which leaves me with only v0 is equal to v1 plus 3 times v2. All right, I'm going to call this my equation 1, and we're going to come back to it. Now I'm going to look at conservation of energy. So I have 1 half m times v0 squared plus 1 half times 3m times 0 squared, nice and convenient, equals 1 half m times v1 squared plus 1 half times 3m times v2 squared. Again, I'm going to make some simplifications. Every term has a 1 half, so I can factor that out and get rid of it. Every term has an m, so I can factor that out and get rid of it. So what's left now is v0 squared on the left side is equal to v1 squared plus 3 times v2 squared on the right. So what I want to do now is take this, my second equation, and substitute, substitute one of these to get rid of it. So it doesn't really matter which one you choose. I'm going to start with this equation, and I'm going to just solve for v1 because that seems really, pretty easy. So here I move this around, and I have v1 would be equal to v0 minus 3v2. And then I substitute for v1 in this equation. So I have v0 squared is equal to v0 minus 3v2 instead of v1, so I square it, plus 3v2 squared. So in order to deal with this, I need to expand. So I have v0 squared is equal to, foiling this out, I have v0 squared minus, ends up being 6v2 times v0, plus 9v2 squared plus 3v2 squared. All right, I need to do some simplification. So first I notice I have v0 squared on the left and on the right. So these are actually going to cancel each other out. Then I notice that I can move some things around. So I'm going to make this positive. So I have 6v2 times v0 is equal to, I can add these terms to get 12v2 squared. And now I can make another simplification. So both terms involve a v2. So I can get rid of one of my v2s. And then I can divide both sides by 12. So what is left is that v2 is equal to 6 over 12 v0, or 1 half v0. Or you can say v0 over 2. Then I can take that and feed it back into this that I've already solved for v1 and say, all right, v1 is equal to v0 minus 3 times 1 half v0. So v1 minus, I'm sorry, v0, sorry, v0 minus 3 halves v0 is negative 1 half v0. And so these two are my answers. So I have v2, so the 3m mass is going to be moving at v0 over 2. And the 1m mass is going to be negative v0 over 2, which leaves me with this d. So both of these take a while. And it's worthwhile to point out that there are going to be multiple choice questions that take a little while. So you have to balance whether or not working through one of these problems is worthwhile for your time. If you know how to do it, then it's absolutely worth your time to work through this and get the correct answer. If you are unsure how to do it, it may not be your worth, or your, worth your time, and it may be a good idea just to think about it for about a minute or two and simply guess and move on. Because the ultimate reality is that on the AP test, you will not have as much time as you want to answer every single multiple choice question. So that's something to consider. Questions 5 and 6 talk about this graph on the top left. And so in this graph, you see two spaceships, and it says they are identical. So why is that important? That means that mass 1 is equal to mass 2 for these spaceships. 
And so they're as far away from you as you can be from any planets or stars, so there's no gravity force to be worrying about. And they're traveling in the same direction, with a slow one behind the faster one. They're connected by a spool, which is just like a big wire. And the cable can be basically reeled in. So this is showing the speed of the two ships over a 10 second interval. So you can see that their velocities to begin with are not quite the same, but they end at the same velocity. And so if we want to know if one of the ships has its engine turned on, what evidence indicates that it is so? Well, the one thing we need to remember is that these two ships are linked together. So delta P, actually I'm gonna go write this up here. So they're linked together, which means that delta P for one of them is going to be the equal and opposite momentum change for the other because the total momentum is going to be conserved. Well, is the total momentum conserved? Well, if they have the same mass, then that means they should undergo the same change in velocity. So m delta v1 has to be equal to n negative m delta v2. Well, if we look at this, we see that, uh, let's say ship one here, delta v1 is going to be negative five, while delta v2 appears to be positive 15. So these are not equal changes. The only way that that is possible is if there is some extra force that is acting on this system, because otherwise their changes in velocity should be identical. So if we actually take a second and think, the total momentum of the system ends up increasing because there is an overall, so a delta V total, of positive 10 meters per second. And so we have some overall velocity and momentum change. So we know we can negate some others simply because of what we know from physics. So just because ship two speeds up does not mean that there is an extra force. It could simply just be reeled in by the other ship. We know that an engine is not necessary to keep a system moving. It can simply move because of inertia. And then D is technically true, right? If you think, does one of the ships have it on? But we know that the momentum changes, right? The, the issue is that the momentum change is not the same for both of them. So however much ship one would slow down, ship two would have to speed up. And while we're here, we're going to go ahead and talk about number six. And it says, which of these is the best representation of the force on the two ship system? Well, for this, we actually need to go a little further and say, all right, F net is equal to, and this is from our definition at the beginning of the chapter, M delta V over delta T. So M delta V over delta T is a force, and this right here is the slope in our graph above. So if we look at these two slopes, we see that one of the slopes is negative and the other is positive. And if you actually think about the net force, so that's going to be the total mass, then you're going to be thinking about the overall or the net slope. So my net slope is going to be the total change in velocity over the total time. Now, first off, we have a couple things we do need to point out. We do need to point out that the slope is linear. And because it's linear, that means that F is a constant, force is a constant. The second part is that we need to know a little bit more and say, okay, well, it's a positive force because overall my velocity change is positive. So we have a positive force and it's constant because these two slopes are linear. Therefore, our answer has to be C where we have a positive and constant force. Question number seven gives us a table where two carts are colliding. One has a mass of five kilograms, one has a mass of one kilogram. We know that during the collision, the average force has a magnitude of 15 newtons, and we want to just know about change in momentum and acceleration for our second cart, given the change in momentum and acceleration for cart one. So first, we will remember that if P momentum is conserved, then that means that delta P for cart one must be equal to the change for part two, just in the opposite direction. 
So that means that if we know the change of momentum to be 0.3 for cart 1, that means that cart 2 is going to be negative 0.3. Well, negative is not an option, but it is that magnitude of 0.3. So we can eliminate C and D because we know that momentum change must be the same size. For the acceleration, you can simply just recall that force is equal to mass times acceleration. So if I know the average force, I can say that this is average force and average acceleration. So if my average acceleration is going to be my average force of 15 newtons divided by the mass of one kilogram, then my average acceleration is going to be 15 meters per second squared. So my final answer here is going to be B. Question number eight is simply another collision question. So a lump of clay is sliding to the right, lump of clay, and it hits, okay, so let's see, one kilogram, and it hits with an initial speed of two, and then it sticks to a metal sphere with a mass of 0.5 kilograms, and that is sliding to the left with a speed of four meters per second. So we're gonna say that's negative four. So what is the kinetic energy of the combined objects after the collision? So it sticks, so the only thing that's going to happen here is that P is conserved, so momentum is conserved, and kinetic energy is not conserved. So setting this up, we have 1 kilogram times positive 2 plus 0.5 kilograms times negative 4 is equal to, pardon me, is equal to our total mass of 1.5 kilograms times our final velocity. So if we look on the left, we have 2 plus a negative 2, which is 0. Therefore, our final velocity has to be 0. Well, if our final velocity is 0, that means that our final kinetic energy ends up being 0. So if this is 0, that means that our final kinetic energy is 0 and our answer is D. Question number nine is a rather difficult one that involves a little bit of detail. So we have a force probe and it's generating this graph above. So it's a very zigzaggy graph and it's showing us force over time. So I'm just gonna go ahead and sketch basically the average of this force over time. So it looks something like this. Now, why is this important? Well. Momentum, if we recall, is the area underneath this graph, or the change in momentum is equal to the area. So the area here is equal to the change in momentum of our, our object. So when we have a constant force, right, you can think about it as being a constant rate of change of momentum. So if force is constant, then the slope of a momentum time graph is constant, right? Because this right here is momentum time graph. So let's see, let's write this. So we're gonna say this is the slope of a momentum time graph. So when we connect those dots, we know that this is going to give us an increasing slope for the first two seconds. So this is a constant slope, so A is out. B is a constant slope, and it's out. C is a constant slope, and it's out. The only one that is not a constant slope is D, and it's actually very difficult to see, that's why the attention to detail is important, that this is slightly curved, and you can see it much more in the four to six section, that this is curved, while this section in the middle is linear. Because when we have a constant force, we have a constant slope. So you can even think, all right, constant force equals constant delta P over delta T. So that gives us our answer of D. So this really hinged on you making the connection that F is delta P over delta T, and that is a slope for this graph below. For question number 10, we have a couple details that people might have missed. So the first we know is that the area of this graph, force times time, is going to give us a change in momentum. And the things that people missed are that this is in milliseconds. So we have to be careful. When we find this area, it's still a triangle, so we have one half the base, which is eight milliseconds, or 0.008 seconds. 
times our force of 500 newtons. So times 500, and that is equal to 2. And so then we need to go in and look at our change in momentum. So 2 is equal to our mass times our final velocity minus our mass times our initial velocity. So 2 is equal to 0.05 times our final velocity, which we don't know, minus 0.05 times our initial velocity, which is to the left at 10 meters per second. So it's actually negative 10. And we go through the process here, and we find that our final velocity is 30 meters per second. So that is an answer choice of A. For question number 11, we have an interesting situation where object A has a mass of 2 kilograms, and it travels to the right at a speed of 3 meters per second. So 2 kilograms to the right, 3 meters per second. And object B, we don't know the mass, is traveling to the left at 3 meters per second. And we know that they collide head-on, and afterward, each has a speed of 3 meters per second. So, that means that VA2 is equal to either plus or minus 3 meters per second, and VB2 is also equal to plus or minus 3 meters per second. So which of the following could be the mass of object B? Well, let's think for a second. If the speed of A is 3 meters per second afterwards, that means that the kinetic energy of A initially is equal to the kinetic energy of A finally, which means kinetic energy must be conserved because there's no other way for those energies to be the same. So that means that KB1 is equal to KB2. So how is this possible? Well, the only way that we can have this occur is if we have a situation where both objects are conserved, or both momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. And so I have M, actually let's set it up this way. So I have two times positive three plus M times negative three equals. And then I have two and let's just assume that it bounces back in the other direction. Why not? Negative 3 plus m times, so that one bounces back in the other way as well. And what I see here is that this is 6 minus 3m equals negative 6 plus 3m. And so what can we do? So we can add this over. We can add that over. We have 6m is equal to 12 or m is equal to 2. Hey, that's possible. This works out just fine. So that means that B is possible. And at this point, it's worth pointing out that a lot of people miss the fact that it asks you to select two answers. So the other answer comes from, well, how can we do this if the other alternative is true? Well, let's assume then that A has a positive velocity afterwards. So I have 2 times 3 minus 3m equals 2 times positive 3 plus 3m. So in this case, I have 6 minus 6 is equal to 0, and then I have 6m. The only way this is possible is if m is pretty much 0. So that means that it is something that is essentially negligible. It's a very tiny, tiny mass compared to 2 kilograms, giving us only b and d as choices. So this is kind of a leap of faith but this realization right here is extremely important.